Hello, my name is John Potosky, and the information I'm presenting is on behalf of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. The uh, Grand Traverse Band is a federally recognized tribe with a reservation in Leelanau County. Uh, the reservation was established in the 1855 treaty, and what I'm going to present to you is a claim that the tribe has on behalf of its tribal members that relate to the 1855 treaty. The United States has entered into formal treaty negotiations with tribes to extinguish the Aboriginal Indian title in the United States. For purposes of Michigan, uh, the Northwest uh, Ordinance, which was uh, passed in 1789-1790, is the, one of the first statutes that Congress created after the Revolution. Uh, the, that land came from uh, disputed territory between England and the United States. The Northwest Ordinance uh, created uh, a conveyance um, from the English uh, Crown to the United States, and the Northwest Ordinance de uh, delineated how the United States would deal with Indian title. Uh, as I said, this was in the 1790s, and the principal um, standard that the United States would use as stated in the Northwest Ordinance was the utmost good faith that the tribes would be protected in their property at all times. As a condition of implementing that Northwest Ordinance, the United States recognized that tribes had a property interest, a real property interest in the land that they controlled, and that the United States could take that property interest through an exchange for agreement known as treaty negotiations. Um, as a consequence of that, the United States has entered into literally hundreds of treaties between native tribes which takes the property, the real property of the tribe in exchange for benefits that the United States will provide to the tribes. In the particular case of Michigan, the principal treaty is the 1836 treaty which provided that the United States would receive a major proportion of the state, the current state of Michigan, uh, approximately 14 million acres, and in exchange for that, the tribes would receive reservations uh, in their homelands uh, that would not, the title would not be extinguished, and that they would continue to live on those reservations. Uh, plus, they would receive um, what we at that time were called annuities, uh, payments uh, that would assist the tribes in converting to the non-Indian way of life. Uh, the 1836 treaty was altered unilaterally by the Congress and provided that the reservations would only exist for five years. And at that time, the tribes would then be forcefully removed from the state of Michigan and relocated to uh, the state of Oklahoma or the state of Kansas. Uh, somewhere further west. This was the official policy of the United States in 1830 uh, just by the enactment of the Indian Removal Act. Most of the southeastern tribes were removed to Oklahoma. Uh, the famous Trail of Tears uh, is probably uh, the most um, egregious example of death in the process of removal. But there were many, many Trail of Tears uh, throughout uh, southern Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, in, in which the tribes were forcefully removed from their original homelands to uh, reservations in Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, principally, the Potawatomis of southern Michigan were removed under forced removal, uh, and they have uh, a big event right now called the Potawatomi Homecoming, in which all of the Potawatomi tribes, which are located in Kansas and Oklahoma, and in various states in between because of their removal history all get together for a reconvening of the original Potawatomi Nation. That's just a side issue. But I'm giving it for context to explain why the Ottawa's of Northern Michigan were concerned about removal. They were uh, escorted, uh, a polite phrase, uh, out to Oklahoma to view the area in which they were to be relocated under the 1836 treaty. And the Ottawa's uh, did not want to go to um, the area in Kansas and Oklahoma that was designated for them to be removed to. As a consequence, they lobbied to stay in the state of Michigan. 
um, and the 1836 treaty, five-year reservations lapsed in 1841, and because of the lobbying that the uh, Ottawa's were doing with the state residents and also with the United States, um, the removal was not actually initiated. The other principal reason of why removal was probably not initiated is because the settlement uh, patterns in the United States uh, pushed further west. Um, the farm season in northern Michigan is not as long as the farm season in southern Michigan and in some of the southern states. As a consequence, there was less developmental southern uh, settlement pressure in the northern part of Michigan. Another factor was is that the tribes in northern Michigan would always step across the arbitrary line separating the United States and Canada. Um, and as a consequence, uh, whenever removal was threatened, the tribes would um, uh, remove themselves to Canada, which is uh, outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. Eventually, the United States changed its policy and said that they would enter into another treaty, which is the Treaty of 1855, in which reservations would be created for the tribes in northern Michigan. Under those treaties, each tribal member was allowed to select 80 acres, and each tribal child was allowed to select 40 acres. The purpose of the selection of the property was to create farms um, and to assimilate the tribes into a farming environment. So from 1855, in the 1855 treaty, it specifically stated uh, that the United States would withdraw from the public land areas in northern Michigan, land located in northern Michigan, which is in our particular case, Leelanau County and major parts of Antrim County, um, and that that would be reserved for Indians to select private property of 80 acres and 40 acres uh, and that they would be able to develop a farm and life in this particular area. So tribes that were located uh, in the Grand Charter Span area um, took themselves to the reservations, the Leelanau and Antrim County, and went through the selection process of acquiring a restricted patent. A restricted patent means that uh, the land would be conveyed to the Indians, but the Indians could not convey it to non-Indians without the consent of the United States. It's also sometimes referred to as trust title. That is to be distinguished from a fee simple title, which is freely conveyable. Uh, this is under um, English land law, which is the inheritance of the United States, um, United States property law. So the property was to be selected by the uh, members of the tribe, 80 acres and 40 acres and the land in Leelanau and Antrim County, as I said, was reserved for the tribes to make their selections prior to other non-Indians entering into the reservation area. The long and short of what the tribes claim is, is that the selection process never was correctly implemented, that selections that were made by Indian tribes were improperly conveyed out of the restricted status, and also that settlers moved into the reservation area and settled uh, without the authority of the United States. Um, these these were, uh, were essentially squatters that were moving into the area and settling without the consent, without the legal consent of the United States, without the legal consent of the state of Michigan, and they were claiming land under um, various statutes of preemption without actually being qualified for that preemption. That took place from 1855 to 1871. Um, in 1871, uh, there was a statute passed in Congress that said all of the illegal settlements, effectively, that were, um, that were made by non-Indians in the reserved areas for the tribes would be retroactively recognized and their titles of the uh, non-Indian settlers would be um, effect, legitimized, uh, even though at the time they were not valid settlements from uh, the 1855 to 1871 forward. That same principle was then carried forward under another series of statutes in 18, um, 
1875 and 1876 that extended variations of legitimization of non-Indian settlement in the reserved areas for the tribes. So essentially what the tribe is arguing is, is that the tribe had a constitutional property interest as United States citizens of private property under the 1855 treaty and that the United States had an obligation to recognize that property interest as a constitutional right under the Fifth Amendment. That right was not recognized. It was subsequently terminated by the 1872 to the 1876 treaties. And that termination is a recognition that the termination of the property right that the tribal citizens had uh, was done without compensation to the tribes. So we are alleging that the 1855 treaty created a reserve for tribal members. The United States did not properly implement the treaty in terms of its conveyance of the 80 acres and the 40 acres to the individual tribal members. And that in addition, non-Indians were allowed to enter into the treaty areas and to make illegal claims against the interest of the Indians and in effect, effectively to take the land without the consent of the United States, without the consent of the state of Michigan, and to make squatter settlement claims within the reservation without um, any um, claim of right or authority under federal or state law. That squatter claims that were made by the settlers were subsequently legitimized by the 1871-72 treaty, 1872 treaty, the 1872 statute, excuse me, 1872 statute by Congress, which said that those non-Indian settlement claims that were done in violation of law between 1855 and 1872 would be recognized as legitimate claims for the non-Indians. That principle was extended in the 1875 and 1876 statute. Also, the treaty provided that tribes would not be subject to taxation uh, for a 10-year time period, and in some cases a longer period, if they were still designated to be uh, incompetent was the term that they used, but really what that meant was is that they didn't have the uh, English ability to understand taxation, nor did they have the cultural ability to understand the non-Indian property ownership process of taxation. Uh, that's not unusual. You're talking about cultures in the clash between uh, the Indians at the time and the non-Indian alien pro project and process of property administration coming into uh, a, uh, another area that was set up uh, through a fraud is something that we call shill sales. And the treaty provided a provision for a 10-year period in which Indians could make individual selections to the preclusion of all other individuals on land uh, for purposes of developing the land for themselves. However, there were Indians that were in cahoots with non-Indians, and these Indians acted as shill acquirers or buying of land, and two individuals, two Indian individuals, bought over 15,000 acres within Leelaw County uh, and resold that land to non-Indians. Uh, these were obviously straw man purchases or shill sales in which these people were acting as, uh, these Indians were acting under that provision that provided for a 10 year window of purchasing land uh, for individual Indian activities. These, were, these individuals were acting as straw man sales for non-Indians. After 1876, the United States still tried to provide uh, remedial relief, if you will, to Indians in this area. And if you're from this area, uh, you will know that a large number of Indians settled out on South Fox Island, a lot of Indians in Peshawi Town, a lot of Indians settled out on Beaver Island. Uh, the United States uh, offered homestead trust titles to Indians to settle out on the islands to get away from the non-Indian settlers that had taken over the counties, both in Lima County and Emmett County. So a large number of Indians in the 1870s, in the 1880s, in the 1890s moved to the islands and set up their trust homesteads out there. 
those lands were still in trust, even South Fox Island, North Fox, uh, to some extent Manitou, those trust titles were still in existence. It's important to emphasize that the claims that LTBB is pursuing is not a title claim, it is a jurisdictional claim. And the claim that GTB is pursuing is not a title claim, it is a constitutional possessory interest claim. What GTB is requesting is Fifth Amendment monetary damages for the illegal taking of private property. That private property was created under the 1855 treaty. It was recognized in the 1872 statute, the 1875 statute, the 1876 statute. And we allege that all of the cases that we have documented of the dispossession, which was basically 15 major categorical processes that dispossessed the tribes of their private property interests should be subject to a compensatory claim from the time of the taking with interest to accrue from the time of the taking. If Congress does authorize the, um, does pass the Congressional Reference Bill, and that is only after review of the merits of our claim, then we file a claim in the United States Court of Claims against the United States. We have a draft complaint that consists of basically 100 pages right at the current basis that delineates all of this in much more uh, detail and specificity. The United States would be able to argue that the claim has no basis in law. Uh, they could argue a, a couple different issues. They could first argue that um, the claim is not recognized under United States constitutional law that Indians as citizens or people or persons in 1855 did not have constitutional rights in which private property interests would be recognized. They could also argue that the um, 1872 statute provided that the United States has plenary authority over Indian affairs and anything that it does in, the in, in relation to Indians cannot be subject to a constitutional analysis. These are all types of arguments that the United States has made in the past. The United States could also argue that the claim has already been presented in what's called the United States um, Indian Claims Commission, which was set up in 1948 after World War II, and which allowed Indians to bring claims like this in a administrative proceeding uh, in, in which the United States had its attorneys defend against um, private attorneys that represented the interest of tribes, arguing that the treaties were unconscionable. Um, they could argue that this matter has already been resolved and is race judicata in existing Indian Claims Commission decisions. We have a very detailed, long memorandum in opposition to that assertion by the United States, which relates to the fact that the 1855 treaty claim was never presented in the uh, Indian Claims Commission proceeding. Uh, and the reason it wasn't presented is because the tribes did not have the ability in terms of its legal sophistication in 1949 and its, stat its basically its poverty status to bring that claim successfully. The only claim that was brought in the Indian Claims Commission proceeding for Northern Michigan was the uh, claim related to the 1836 treaty. And so we would argue that we have the ability to bring this 1855 treaty claim. And that's not out of the realm of possibilities because there are other tribes that have essentially made the same argument and were permitted to bring a claim even though there was a pre-existing ICC decision. Assuming the tribe gets across or prevails on all of these substantive claims that the United States would argue, then there would be a valuation claim of, of whether or not these 16 methodologies of liquidating Indian title uh, are in effect uh, um, taking of private property. So that, that would be the substance of the claim. So we don't expect the issue to be resolved by um, the Court of Claims procedure for a couple years, several years in fact. And it would be only be after the tribes prevailed in the Court of Claims that our argument is just and our argument 
um, actually holds the United States liable for the taking of private property, that there would be a recommendation from the Court of Claims to Congress that it is a just claim. Then Congress would have to implement the remedy by passing a specific statute saying that uh, based upon the adjudication in the Court of Claims, pursuant to the Congressional Reference Statute, that the tribes would receive payment for the uh, Fifth Amendment taking of tribal land under the 1855 treaty. So this is a long timeline, uh, and it consists of getting the Congressional bill passed, and that's basically um, getting Congress to agree, either in the House or the Senate, that the tribe has a valid Congressional claim that only authorizes us to present the claim in the Court of Claims, and we still have to prove our case that we would uh, prevail against the United States. That would take a couple years in terms of the Court of Claims actually coming up with an opinion with uh, the actual trial, uh, the uh, surviving the motions to dismiss in the preliminary stages, uh, such as race judicata or plenary power or no constitutional rights for Indians in the 1850s, um, prevailing over all of those um, predicate legal issues to get to the actual substantive claims of how the land was taken out of the possession of the United States by a series of, as I said, these transactions that we argue were illegal and in violation of the 1855 treaty, and then the subsequent 1872, 75, and 76 federal statute that legitimized all of those takings that we would prove between 1855 and 1872, and then there would be the valuation phase of what are the damages for those takings based upon going through the itemized list. And only then, if you had a successful judgment in the Court of Claims by, in the fact it's an advisory opinion that from the Court of Claims judges, and uh, is it possible to go back to Congress and say to Congress effectively, look, we proved our claim in the Court of Claims, now, Congress, it's up to you to enact this as a judgment and a remedy for the tribes. So it's a very long time process. It doesn't disenfranchise or take the possessory interest title of any of the current title holders in Leelanau or Antrim County. We emphasize that it's a constitutional claim against the United States who we, the tribe, recognizes or assert is the principal culprit in this whole matter because it did not follow the terms of the 1855 treaty when it established the public reserved land treaties for the tribes and created a property interest under the treaty of 80 acres and 40 acres for all tribal members and that was never effectively implemented because it was never effectively implemented non-Indians came into the reservation settled illegally then used the political process to get their illegal settlements legitimized by the subsequent congressional action. And we're saying that that violated our rights as citizens, as private property owners, and then taking a private property created under the 1855 treaty without just compensation, and we are seeking just compensation against the United States for that historical taking.